life moves pretty fast. Shoot it up. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Well, Ferris Bueller's Day Off moves pretty fast, too. Perhaps everyone has seen it so many times that they didn't even stop and look around and realize that there are a lot of baffling events in the movie. One of Ferris's earliest schemes involves securing a car for the day. Ferris tells us, I asked for a car, I got a computer. As a way of explaining why he doesn't have wheels of his own. The problem is that his computer is one of the many expensive toys that fill his bedroom. In addition to a computer, cool enough to be connected to the web in the mid-80s, Ferris's room is also stuffed with a slick sound system and even a synthesizer he puts to particularly good use. <coughs> Throw in a classic electric guitar, and he's got quite a bit of money laying around. Sell your stuff, Bueller. After fooling his parents with a fake illness, Ferris's next big task is convincing his best friend Cameron Fry to join him on his day off. Ironically, Cameron is already out of school for the day, homesick in bed for real. Ferris doesn't believe Cameron, noting his hypochondriac tendencies, but Cameron does seem to be quite ill, so much so that he barely feels like moving. Somehow, Ferris is able to rouse him and bring him along on the trip, and just like that, Cameron is fine. He goes from lying in bed to hanging out at a Chicago Cubs game. Not once during the day do we see Cameron becoming dizzy, trying to nap, or knocking back some Dayquil. He was either faking it, or he was miraculously cured. Ferris invites Cameron along, in part because he needs a car. They could just use Cameron's, but Ferris is too greedy for that. He wants to spend the day out on the town in style, and has his heart set on stealing Cameron's father's car, a limited edition 1961 Ferrari convertible. It's a pretty sweet ride, and so valuable that Cameron's dad doesn't even drive it. He just rubs it with a diaper. Despite the car's value, though, there's little to no security for it. It's just sitting there, without any protection, in the garage, which Cameron and Ferris can just walk into. It's almost as if Mr. Fry wants it to get stolen. Ferris covers his tracks at his house with a dummy, a complex pulley system, and a tape playing snoring sounds. By comparison, his scheme to get his girlfriend Sloane Peterson out of school for the day is surprisingly low-tech. It starts with a phone call from Cameron, posing as Sloane's father, claiming her grandmother died. Ferris and Cameron then head to the school to grab Sloane. When Ferris arrives, he has to disguise himself as her father by wearing an oversized trench coat and old-fashioned hat. Somehow, Dean of Students Mr. Rooney is fooled by the lazy ruse, even after Ferris and Sloane share a long, wet kiss. One of the first things Ferris does on his day off is take Cameron and Sloane to an extremely fancy restaurant. He doesn't have a reservation, so he steals someone else's from the restaurant's list. For this scheme, he chooses to pose as Abe Froman, the sausage king of Chicago. The restaurant's host is, of course, very skeptical of Ferris's claim. Ferris works around him by having Sloane call the restaurant and describe him as Froman. Somehow, it works, and the baby-faced teen who is obviously not a meat magnate gets his table. One of the most famous scenes in Ferris Bueller's Day Off is the parade sequence, but there's a lot about the scene that's hard to understand. It's a big cultural event that shuts down several downtown city blocks, but it's somehow held in the middle of a weekday. The heart of the scene is a bit baffling, too. Huge parades are highly secured, but this one just lets some random teen up onto a float to lip sync to an old Wayne Newton song. And why does the float have a microphone anyway? It's not hooked up to any kind of sound system. This all leads to a synchronized dance number set to Twist and Shout. It's a little more realistic that Ferris would know that song, but it's not realistic at all that a bunch of people have put together dance routines to go along with this otherwise completely spontaneous performance. Ferris plans his day off so it's packed with extremely fun activities. He and his friends go to the Sears Tower, the Art Institute of Chicago, a fancy lunch, a Chicago Cubs game, and even a parade. One problem with packing all that into one day is that there's no way Ferris, Cameron, and Sloane could fit it all in with the limited time they've got. It's mid-morning by the time Ferris convinces Cameron to come with him. Then he has to jailbreak Sloane from school and then drive into the city. Once they're in the city, they have to leave the car in a garage. Factoring in travel time between activities, plus setbacks like traffic, there's no way Ferris is getting back to the suburbs before his parents. The villain of the film is Dean of Students Ed Rooney, and he both hates and obsesses over Ferris Bueller. The thing is that Rooney actually has a good reason, noting that Ferris... He gives good kids bad ideas. It's Rooney's job to keep the student body in line and in class, something Ferris doesn't help with. He has so many absences that it's a problem. Rooney knows this, and even sees the evidence of Ferris covering his tracks by hacking school records. So Rooney spends the movie tracking Bueller to prove the kid isn't really sick. 
He goes through a lot of nonsense to catch Bueller in the act of skipping school, which means he's really just a guy trying to do his job. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.